Over the past year, we've seen record wildfires, floods, and heat waves all over the world. The good news is that we're getting better at responding to these disasters thanks to advances in weather prediction and climate science. The bad news is that these kinds of destructive weather events are happening much more often, yet we're still not very good at predicting them. Of course, we're no strangers to extreme weather here in the United States. Texas has been in a drought since September of last year, straining the water supply, damaging crops, and forcing ranchers to sell off their cattle. Droughts also make it difficult for the ground to absorb heavy rain. Recently, the Dallas, Texas area was hit with a one in a thousand year flood thanks to intense rainfall on the back of that massive drought. With nowhere for the water to drain, the flood destroyed both private property and public infrastructure without impunity. This summer, over 100 million Americans across 28 states were under extreme heat advisories and warnings. That's over one third of the entire US population. Recent studies estimate that the total economic losses from heat exceed $100 billion per year in the United States alone, and that number is expected to double by 2030 and 5x by 2050. But when it comes to extreme weather, the United States isn't alone. Millions of people across India and Bangladesh are being affected by heavy rains causing raging floods and landslides, killing hundreds and displacing hundreds of thousands. It's estimated to be the worst flooding in the region in over 120 years, with as many as 4 million people being stranded by flash floods. This year, the number of wildfires in Europe is four times higher than average, forcing tens of thousands of people to evacuate. An estimated 1.6 million acres of land across Europe have been burned since the start of the year. For reference, that's about 1.5 million football fields on fire. Luton Airport, which is just north of London, had to suspend and divert flights because excessive heat literally melted the patches off the runway. And London's East Midlands Railway urged people to refrain from traveling because extreme temperatures can cause the track to literally buckle and bend. Melted runways, warped train tracks, burning crops, droughts, flash floods, and power outages. This isn't a political channel and I'm not here to tell you what to believe when it comes to climate science. What I'm showing you are just a tiny fraction of the massive and measurable impacts of extreme weather events happening all around the world. And these events are happening much more often. Now that we've identified the problem, we can start talking about some cutting edge solutions. First off, it's important to understand the difference between climate and weather. When we talk about the weather, we're talking about temperature, humidity, precipitation, visibility, wind speeds, pressure, and so on. So extreme weather events are when these measures are very far from normal. Extreme rain, extreme heat, extreme winds. At a high level, the weather is the way atmospheric events affect our lives in the short term, hours, days, weeks, and even seasons. The way we predict weather is pretty straightforward. Data is gathered from satellites and weather stations that monitor the atmosphere. Then that data is used in two different ways. First, it's put into models that try to predict what future weather updates would look like. For example, let's say a satellite sees different wind directions changing, wind speeds picking up, and cloud cover increasing over a coastline. That data would get fed into a model that helps decide if we're seeing a normal weather pattern, the start of a storm system, or something else entirely. If it is a storm, a different model might try to predict that storm's 3D structure, its footprint on the ground, its intensity and direction, and so on. That data is also used to correct past predictions and retrain the weather models to make them more accurate over time. Weather models are currently updated roughly every six hours to account for the most recent observations in their forecasts. So weather models ask questions like, if a weather satellite does see a storm, how different is the actual storm from what the model predicted? And what should it adjust to reduce these differences in the future? You might be wondering if it takes a lot of computing power to predict global weather patterns, 3D structures in the atmosphere, and their effects over the entire surface of the Earth. The answer is yes. In fact, weather prediction is one of the biggest drivers for supercomputers to keep improving over time. This summer, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration debuted two new supercomputers named Dogwood and Cactus. These new NOAA supercomputers are tied for the 49th and 50th fastest supercomputers in the world. As these computers get better, our weather predictions become higher resolution, which means that they have higher accuracy over smaller distances and shorter timescales. That's why we get pretty accurate weather forecasts town by town now instead of county by county, or why weather predictions can show individual storm cells and cloud systems instead of just big blobs. 
These supercomputers can also run multiple weather models at once, which take in different sets of weather data to predict a range of future possibilities. Likewise, it also lets NOAA scientists analyze more data from better sources, such as newer satellites with better sensors on them. But what these supercomputers don't help us do is predict weather further out into the future. Today, five-day forecasts are accurate around 90% of the time, seven-day forecasts are accurate about 80% of the time, and 10-day forecasts are only accurate about half the time. That doesn't sound so bad, but it also matters just how wrong a forecast can be. And they can be very wrong. Here, let me show you. In 2015, then New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio issued a severe snowstorm warning. He was quoted saying this could be the biggest snowstorm in the history of the city. My message for New Yorkers is to prepare for something worse than we have ever seen before." End quote. New York City authorities imposed a driving ban, and for the first time in history, the subway was shut down in anticipation of snow. When the snow finally came, New York City got a whopping 5 inches, which wasn't even 15% of the forecasted 3 feet. Still, it's better to be safe than sorry. On the other hand, in March of 2020, 25 people died after a tornado ripped through central Tennessee, including Nashville. The tornado hit the downtown area late at night and caught many people unaware because the National Weather Service said that Nashville was only at a slight risk for severe weather. So these 25 deaths might have been prevented with proper warning. But severe storms don't usually offer much lead time because tornadoes happen quickly and then they're gone. So this is the real challenge. To prepare for extreme weather, we need to be able to predict it. But extreme weather by its nature is very unpredictable. And that begs the question, if bigger and faster supercomputers can't save us, what can? While faster and more powerful supercomputers give us higher resolution weather estimates and more confident predictions, they don't help us predict extreme weather further in advance. That's where climate data comes in. Predicting climate change, so to develop strategies to mitigate and adapt, is arguably one of the greatest challenges facing society today. We don't currently have the ability to accurately predict the climate decades out. Although much is known about the physics, the scale of the simulation is daunting. Climate simulation is much harder than weather simulation, which largely models atmospheric physics, and the accuracy of the model can be validated every few days. Long-term climate prediction must model the physics of Earth's atmosphere, oceans and waters, ice, the lands, and human activities, and all of their interplay. Further, simulation resolutions of 1 to 10 meters are needed to incorporate effects like low atmospheric clouds that reflect sun's radiation back to space. Ignoring these contributions accumulate the significant error in the long-term predictions. This is 10 to 100,000 times higher resolution than any weather simulation today. There are no computers big enough that we can build. We need a computer science breakthrough. The big challenge with climate simulations today is that they need to account for very small changes over Earth's entire surface and atmosphere over very long periods of time. Things like clouds reflecting sunlight back into space, CO2 emissions from large industrial sites, and changes in depth for smaller bodies of water. If these models don't capture these finer details, the resulting errors start compounding pretty fast as their prediction goes further out in time. Current state-of-the-art climate simulations only have around 10 to 100 kilometer resolutions. That's roughly the size of Manhattan. But the problem requires the model's resolution to be roughly the size of your desk. One potential solution is just to wait for computers to get about a million times better. At the current rate that computers are improving, that would take about 30 to 40 years. But droughts, flash floods, wildfires, and hurricanes are all already problems today, and they're becoming much more frequent. Well, it turns out that there are other ways to start chipping away at this problem. These would be changes made to the hardware, software, and models that we currently use to predict the weather. Changes including using machine learning to model atmospheric physics instead of the numerical models we use today, using GPU accelerated code and tools instead of traditional ones that run on CPUs, and then build GPU-based supercomputers specifically for these kinds of AI models and code bases. And just to be clear, there's an incredible amount of smart people working on these hard problems right now. But since Nvidia has the lion's share of the GPU and AI processing market for hyperscale computing, which is exactly what this kind of weather prediction requires, let me quickly highlight a few of their efforts in this area. Nvidia has implemented an AI technique called a Fourier Neural Operator, or FNO. The goal of this technique is to use a combination of AI and physics models to learn how to behave like complex physical systems. 
Scientists said NVIDIA recently published a new paper that optimizes this technique specifically for predicting weather. Using this new adaptive FNO, NVIDIA built a system called ForecastNet. ForecastNet is an AI-enabled digital twin of the world's atmosphere. It's trained on 10 terabytes of weather system data, and it's the first deep learning model to surpass NOAA forecasts in both speed and accuracy. ForecastNet can predict the behavior of extreme weather events around the globe, like the precise path of a given hurricane, with much more accuracy than traditional NOAA forecasts. It can also make extreme weather predictions a full four days in advance and provide near real-time updates as conditions continue to change. That's because NVIDIA's models only take a quarter second to run, which is over 50,000 times faster than today's numerical weather models. Ultimately, ForecastNet is part of a larger effort to create a real-time digital twin of the entire world, called Earth2. Earth2 will be the world's most powerful AI supercomputer designed specifically for climate change. It'll be a physically accurate, ultra-high resolution replica of the world, and it will continuously predict climate and weather events at every scale based on the latest available data. I recently had a chance to sit down with Karthik Kashinath from NVIDIA. Karthik is the engineering lead for the entire Earth2 initiative, the full stack of hardware, software, and the science behind it. Here's what he had to say about how Earth2 is changing the game when it comes to extreme weather prediction. So the, uh, the strategy for Earth2 is that we are combining these data-driven models with high-resolution climate simulations and hybrid modeling where we combine machine learning with numerical simulations to really achieve uh, capabilities that were never possible before and cannot be achieved using traditional numerical methods. So one example of the types of things that this model can achieve is it can achieve very high resolution forecasts of the weather up to about a week in advance. And what we're seeing here is the skill of this model on predicting surface winds, which are critical for things like wind energy forecasting, uh, but also for things like uh, disaster management when we have hurricanes and, and other extreme weather events. So there's just some very attractive features to ForecastNet. First of all, it's the highest resolution data-driven weather forecasting model that, that's ever been built. Uh, and in particular, it's eight, eight times higher resolution than the previous state-of-the-art. The other key feature that makes ForecastNet so powerful and attractive is the computational speed and performance. And so we have ForecastNet performing at 44,000 times faster in terms of speed for this forecast compared to IFS. Uh, the energy consumption for a single forecast from ForecastNet is about 12,000 times cheaper uh, in terms of energy consumed versus a traditional numerical model. So what does this mean for uh, numerical weather prediction? Well, what this means is that we can generate data-driven weather forecasts uh, about 50,000 times faster than traditional numerical models. So this allows us to explore a much wider range of outcomes and possibilities and capture the risk of the most extreme events more accurately. And this means that you can enable new scientific discoveries at scale that were not possible before. So Earth2 isn't just about being able to predict extreme weather further out into the future. It's also about making those predictions tens of thousands of times faster, which lets climate scientists and meteorologists run tests for all kinds of climate and weather scenarios. Scientists, economists, and companies all around the world will be able to log into Earth2 to understand how the weather could impact their efforts and supply chains. Farmers could use these tools to predict the impacts of extreme weather on their crops and soil, and governments could use them to answer all sorts of questions at the national level, like how extreme weather affects certain industries, different kinds of infrastructure, and even an entire country's food and water security. And they'll be able to do all of this days, weeks, and maybe even months out with far more confidence than today. In a few short years, these results could even be timely enough to warn individual cities and towns far enough in advance for them to take action, whether that means stocking up on supplies, reinforcing infrastructure, or evacuating those in harm's way. One day, extreme weather might not kill thousands, might not displace millions, and might not cost the world billions of dollars every year. Unprecedented terrifying, apocalyptic. These are just some of the words used to describe the wildfires, heat waves, and floods happening all around the world. But in a few short years, we might just have the tools we need to plan, prepare for, or even mitigate them altogether. 
and whatever your stance on climate change, I hope you agree that that's a future worth investing in. But you don't have to wait a few years to see Earth 2 in action. You can join me on Thursday, September 22nd for an exclusive online party hosted by NVIDIA. I'll be joined by Karthik himself, as well as other content creators who focus on innovations in renewable energy and climate science. If you want to join us as we learn all about NVIDIA's Earth 2 initiative, or you just want to win a sweet GeForce 3080 Ti graphics card, use the NVIDIA link in the description below to register for the event for free. Just create an NVIDIA account and fill out the registration form for GTC, which is their biggest conference of the year. Once you're registered, go to View Sessions and add the watch party to your schedule. The invite has all the information you need for the day of the event, including how to enter to win the card. If you need help finding the right watch party, just search for WP41326 and my session should come up. I'll leave these instructions in the description below as well. Speaking of which, comment below with any questions that you want me to ask the NVIDIA team about weather prediction, climate science, supercomputing, digital twins, or anything else related to the session. I'll make sure that your voice is heard. Or if you want to learn more about world-changing innovations you can invest in, check out this episode next. And if you feel I've earned it, hit those like and subscribe buttons to let me know that you enjoyed this type of content. Either way, thanks for watching, and until next time, this is Ticker Symbol U. My name is Alex, reminding you that the best investment you can make is in you.